Good afternoon, everyone. Ooh. <laughs> I realize I'm like halfway through the slides on my computer. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I was obviously ready to switch over from the uh, starting soon to the live. Um, uh, welcome to lecture four of Comp 1511. Just making sure my camera is actually aimed at where I'm sitting. Um, Lots of fun chat uh, prior to the lecture today on YouTube. Um, I think a lot of people have been looking at the word edition challenge. So whether you have or haven't looked at the challenge, uh, basically what we did was we said, all right, so if you know if statements, uh, what if we ask you to do something that has a whole lot of different possible conditions and there's no nice way of getting around this other than writing a large number of if statements and saying, okay, Song's going to be one of 10 different possibilities. Well, maybe 10, maybe 20. I think um, if you if you sort of explode it all outwards into the total number of possibilities this thing can show, it's 10 times 10 times 3, maybe? Something like, if, if you did it in a particular way, you could end up writing uh, about 300 different print statements. Um, there's ways you can think about it to try to reduce that, and that's interesting and stuff. But really, for, for anyone who's looked at it, this is a, a little bit of a, um, nearly a, a, a primer for what's coming next, in that when you see the difficulty of using the tools that we have at the moment to, um, uh, to do what are actually, when you think about it, reasonably simple tasks, um, you'll see that we need to expand our tool set. So that's the reason that challenge is there. Heaps of people look at that challenge and just go, oh, why do I have to do this? <laughs> and it's always, sorry, I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> I'm still laughing anyway. <laughs> but it's, it's a really interesting thing. So I do like to do this when we're, we're teaching is you, you can't just kind of go through and go, oh, everything's going to be easy because not everything's going to be easy. And sometimes knowing, knowing why something should be the way it is um, because of how hard things can be without it, gives you much more of a kind of a, a rationale behind other things existing. So as we start piling on more capabilities, um, you'll start to find that, ah, oh, there are these things that we've seen before that we could do better with these new capabilities, or like looking at these new possibilities, that means a lot of things that we would consider as kind of drudgery in coding, repetitive tasks and things like that, we're going to get around them. And every programming language is, is going to have its way of getting around repetitive drudgery of tasks. Um, because you don't really want to do that. Um, there's, I mean, you know, if you, if you get a job, you're doing work, they don't call it work because everything's fun, <laughs> you know. So there's always going to be some stuff that feels a bit like that. Uh, but we're going to... Uh, we're going to be sort of going through and, and building up our capability to... Um, uh, to do things to reduce the amount of kind of repetition that we're going to have to do as humans. Because the computer doesn't get bored. The computer, in fact, is cycling its repetition over and over and over again. The CPU over here is just spinning um, at um, several million times a second. And what it's doing a lot of the time in that several million times a second is basically saying... I'm doing no maths, I'm doing no maths, I'm doing no, no, no maths, I'm doing no maths, until we say, okay, do some maths, and it goes, oh, I'm going to do some maths. And then it keeps going going to doing no maths, but it never stops spinning. So there's that interesting thing, the computer's never going to get bored of it, so we might as well get our repetitive tasks and give them to the computer instead of ourselves doing repetitive coding. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's get into the slides. What did we talk about last week? Oh, not last week, we're just like still last lecture on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we did a quick recap of everything we've seen so far. So all of the C's, so we're talking variables, if statements, and the things we put into the if statements. Um, so we did a quick recap on all of that. So questions like relational operators, logical operators, and things like that. <laughs> what is it? I think someone wants to say hi. I don't know if you could hear her meowing at me just then. But uh, Chicken has come to say hello. She's been acting very bored this afternoon and bothering me all day, so I figured she would probably come and jump up during the lecture. Okay, and we also looked at problem solving. Uh, and that was an interesting thing. We were thinking about all the different things that could potentially go wrong or whatever while we're, um, 
while we're working on a program or all the ways that we could write a program where it doesn't quite do what we wanted it to do and think about ways that we can try different solutions and assess those solutions and see what it was that was going to work well and this is something that i consider to be a a long-term um long-term learning because you're never going to stop using these kinds of problem solving methods um just gonna turn this a little so that the lecturer in charge is in shot um we also did a little bit about using hash defines for things um and we're also um showed a little bit of use of modulus and there was a very interesting discussion about modulus actually happened after the lecture finished that was um the fact that uh, python and c actually deal with negative modulus in different ways so that's that's very interesting and potentially awkward in a sense because uh you can't always trust programming languages to do the exact same thing as each other excuse me chicken i need to get to my mouse okay so today as i hinted when I was talking about repetitive tasks and things like that, um, today we are looking at looping. So looping is an idea that is actually very common in programming. Um, it's always going to be one of the earliest things that we learn in any particular programming language is um, how do I make it so I don't have to type in the same thing again and again and again. Uh, we want to make sure that we can get to that and um, the construct that works like that in C is this thing called while loops. Um, there are actually multiple different types of loops in C, but functionally they're all going to do the same thing, which is to be able to run the same code multiple times. Um, so we're just going to do while loops because while loops are the most open version of all the loops. Uh, they have the most uh, kind of capability to to run and easiest to understand in terms of just you just go line by line through the while loop you don't have any special weirdness going on in them so we're going to focus entirely on while loops and you can do the entire course with only while loops people are going to talk about other kinds of loops uh, you can safely ignore <laughs> what anyone says about the other kinds of loops because in the course we're just going to use while loops and it's enough um, and it's actually enough for you know deep into professional programming you could still only use while loops and you'd get away with it because the other loops are just a, a different way of writing the same thing. So we're going to look at the loops themselves, and then we're going to learn about how to start and stop loops. Oh, I scared her away by moving the mouse. I apologize. You're just back to me now. Um, and we're going to look at things that we can do with these loops. So the oh, I'm nearly but not quite covering up the text, so it'll be OK there. So. What happens when we want to do the same thing more than once? Uh, so sometimes we want to repeat something that we've done. So examples of, of why we might want to repeat things. So for example, um, last, last week, I should was Wednesday and last week, Wednesday, we were looking at taking in input from two dice. Um, we could potentially do something so that the input code, because you see the input code for both dice, it look very, very similar. There's potentially a way that we could do something where instead of writing that code twice, we would have the input code written once and we would run it twice instead of writing it twice. So that's this kind of thing that we're, we're doing with looping. So from earlier than today, we'd been running our C code line by line. And we're going, okay, from the start of the main, and down, we just go one line to the next and things happen in order one after the other. We learnt one thing to be able to turn on or off parts of those code, which is the if and else statements. So that allows us to say, okay, this runs, but this doesn't, or choose between these things and this runs. Um, but we haven't had a nice way to say, let's do the same thing over and again. So if I wanted to do the same task again and again and again, so for example, something like, check what a number is that someone's typed in and then print out a, a word instead. Um, there wasn't really a nice way to do that. But if we had um, uh, if we had a way to loop through our code, maybe we could do that um, by executing the same code multiple times instead of sort of copy pasting this same number check printout word thing. I don't think that exactly works for the word addition thing. I think we're gonna need more than that. But we still have the idea that we don't really want the same code appearing multiple times for us to do multiple things. So I present to you the first loop, the while loop. So this is something that um, 
we're going to learn about, and it's our way of repeating the code that is inside the curly brackets here. You'll notice that the basic layout of a while loop is nearly identical to the basic layout of the if statement. The only difference is it has the keyword while instead of the keyword if. So in terms of typing this thing in, it should be pretty easy to get going. Um, the difference, however, is how it performs. So when we hit the while loop, we have an expression in the brackets. This is exactly the same as the if statement. It will evaluate this expression, so maybe it's a question. Um, maybe you just put a number in there, but usually it's a relational uh, operator between things to test if something has met certain criteria. If this expression is true, then the body of the loop will run, which means the lines in between these two curly brackets will run one at a time until we hit the bottom curly bracket. The difference there, and this is the only difference between an if statement and a while loop, is when we hit the bottom curly bracket here, instead of just continuing onwards or jumping into an else statement or something like that, like an if would do, when a while loop hits its closed curling bracket, it jumps back up to the while and it starts at this line again. So when it hits the bottom, comes back up here and it checks the expression. If the expression is still true, it will keep going. No, the trick generally is somewhere in this code there might be a way to change the expression. If there's a way to change the expression in here, then there's a chance that when you loop back up, it's false and then you might stop. So when you stop, you jump over what's in the curly brackets and then you can just continue from the lines below. So the while loop will run if the expression is true. And if the expression was true and the while loop ran, it will always try to run again. When it tries to run again, it will always check the expression. If the expression's ever false, it skips the while loop. So it runs really, really similarly to an if statement where it says check the expression and only run it if the expression is true. The only difference is every time it runs, it tries again. So it's gonna keep trying to go again. Um, this chat there, well, I see Rani's answering a lot of stuff in chat, so I won't, I won't stop and read everything that's happening in chat. Okay, so, I think I've already said everything here while I was looking at the code, but this is it in text in case you need it. So, while's a new C keyword, which means don't try to name any of your variables the word while, uh, C will have issues with that. Um, the question, just like the if statement in brackets, and I think I've said everything that's on this slide, but it's here in text if you wanna go back over it and be really clear on what's happening. Let me just push my face out of the way of the text there. So if we have something that can keep going, um, then we need to think about um, how do we make sure it doesn't keep going forever or um, how do we make it stop or how do we control how many times it, ru it runs. So I'm gonna show you two techniques today and these are the two most basic ways that we're going to run loops. Uh, one of them is a loop that runs a specific number of times. So we can actually set something up to say this loop will run an exact number of times. Um, and we do that using a variable called a loop counter. So this is a variable that is um, declared outside of the loop. So we don't put it inside the loop's body. We put it before the loop. I'll show you in a second how it works. And it can count how many times the loop has run. So what it does is it says every time the loop is run, the loop will say, I've run one more time than I did before this number goes up, and when it reaches a certain point, uh, the program knows that the loop has run a certain number of times, and we say, okay, we're done, and then we stop looping. So that's how we can say, for example, I want this loop to run exactly 10 times. So maybe I'm doing something with the numbers um, one through to 10 and um, converting them to a word or something. So I could loop through and do it like that, maybe. I'm not sure if that works for that example, but you know. Um, the other way that we can do looping is we can say, keep doing this loop forever. So I want you to just keep doing this thing until something happens. And when that thing happens, we will then turn off a switch and say this loop will not continue to run. So that's how we would um, potentially do the first two loops we can think of. Nearly all loops are gonna be of, of one of these two patterns. So I'll teach you these, get you working with these. And then as you get deeper into it and you start learning about loops, you can be like, okay, we can get, we can get trickier with these things. But for the moment, we want to, um, we want to make sure that we have uh, the capability to say, okay, loop runs an exact number of times or 
loop stops with an exact condition. So let's have a little closer look at both of these setups. So here's a code setup for a loop that runs a really specific number of times. The first thing we do is we create a, a variable and there's a number variable here. I've called it counter. Um, you can kind of call it what you want. The programming tradition, I'm going to call it a tradition. It's, it's kind of something that is accepted that um, a lot of experienced programmers when they see it will be like, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're doing here is the letter I for one of these. We call them iterators and it's a number that counts how many times something has happened. And have we, oh, we haven't used count um, variables yet. We'll probably use that in the demo today. But yeah, so this counter says this is how many times the loop has run. So we started at zero because if the loop it hasn't even, we haven't reached the loop code yet, then we've definitely run the loop zero number of times. And then we can have this loop here and we could even run this. I think it's in my demo code that's already available for this week. Um, every time this thing runs, it will do whatever's inside the curly bracket. So first it'll say, is the counter less than 10? Counter starts at zero, less than 10, so it will run. And it says, we have looped this many times. And so since we haven't completed any loops yet, it'll say, we have looped zero times. But then we say counter is now equal to counter plus one, which means that whatever the counter had been when we were in that loop, it's now one higher. So the very first time we run the loop, it's zero and it becomes one. And then we come to the closing brackets and we come back up here. Because the while loop always tries to repeat itself, we come up here and counter is equal to one and we say, is one less than 10? Yes, one is less than 10, we're gonna run again. And this time we would print out, we have looped one time and etc. And we're gonna keep doing that. But we will reach a point where the counter is equal to 10 and that'll be after we print it, print out, um, we've looped nine times, I think. Yeah, because this is saying how many times we've looped previously. When the counter is equal to 10, it will then fail this check, and then we'll hop out and we'll continue running whatever other code we have there. Let me just, I'll go back. I'll get back to that one. That's like one of my funny slides. <laughs> So as usual, uh, my code is available. It's not lecture two, this one's lecture four. Code for today, I will copy it into chat. Um, that will be the live code for today, but I will access it via my um, VLab here. Mm, lecture four. I'm pretty sure I've got these demos already in here. Yes, here we go. So, first loop is a basic loop with a counter. What I will do... is just comment out the rest of this program so we can see one bit of it at a time. So the only thing that's gonna run here at the moment is this loop, which is an exact copy of the loop that I had um, in the lecture slide a second ago. So we can compile this, tab completing again, makes things much quicker. Unfortunately, when, we, when I'm working in this direction, it means you're gonna get all these extra files in there, which are like the files I'm using to run it, like the program file, you don't have to use that. The C file is the important bit. But let's run loop demo, and we'll see what I was saying before when I was stepping through the slides. Now we have the ability with a small number of lines of code to do a large amount of work. Granted, the amount of the work that we're doing is nearly identical uh, in each, um, uh, each time we run it, but we can do things where the thing that makes each loop different is the variable counter, because that's the thing that changes each time. So we can say this thing is now counting how many times it has, it has run. Um, there's even a comment in here that helps us that says, um, inside this while loop, when we reach this bracket in this point in the while loop, uh, this comment tells us this code has run this number of times. And so we know that 
any time that we're inside this loop, the counter variable's telling us how many times the loop has run previously. So, handy little thing like that. And with that, we can now create a loop that will run a very specific number of times. So one thing that I was um, pointing out before, and this is one thing that we're always gonna have to remember anytime we build any looping code, is we have to make sure we know how to stop it. Right, so there's a possibility we can write looping code that just keeps going, and then it could keep going forever, and it could just keep looping, um, and then we can end up in a situation like so, where, just move my face out of the way of that, we could make a loop where the condition is always true. So I've just done a really, really simple condition here. One is less than two, which means that at this point, um, Wow, I just rickrolled everyone exactly at 420. <laughs> anyway, so for anyone who hasn't um, hasn't heard of a performer called Rick Astley, uh, he has a song which has the lyrics in it, never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down, never gonna turn around and desert you. And um, it's it's been a really, really common uh, song to use or a, uh, a web link <laughs> and stuff to... Um, to, to send to people as just a joke to make them hear this song over and over and over again. Which is why I thought it would be quite funny to put in this in this while loop here. So if we're in a situation where... <laughs> um, I apologize that people like, you're explaining the joke, but I, I should explain it because like there's a bunch of people who may not necessarily have seen uh, what the deal is with Rick Rowling. So this is what everyone else is laughing about. So... Um, this loop is one that can potentially go forever and there's no way to stop this. So I should actually show you this running um, because it will be an issue and this is always going to be an issue when you're, um, uh, when, you're, when you're working on programs is you could get into a situation, I'm just commenting out the bits of the program that I'm not running right now. And I will uncomment this. This one was commented out. Oh wait, that is a comment. I'm gonna turn this into a printf for fun. I think I've got the right number of spaces there, yes. Because I want to show you what happens if we run something that, that goes forever like this. Because you're going to, in your learning about making loops and stuff, it's a very common mistake. I mean, it's not just in your learning about making loops. Um, we all do this a lot of the time when we're making loops, is we make a loop that goes forever. And we're like, oh, oops, I did that, and that happens. So, this condition will never be false unless something really, really fundamental happens to mathematics and the way that we do mathematics in programming. So since this condition is never false, this while loop will never exit, which means it's gonna keep running these two lines over and over again. So let's see what happens when I compile and run this. Again, using my up and down arrow keys, in case you haven't, uh, you didn't see what I did in previous lectures, we can get to previous commands with the up and down arrow keys. So I'm recompiling this code. So now, instead of it being that first while loop, I've commented out that first while loop, and now we're only doing this while loop, which is the previous one was the first while loop. This is the worst while loop. I'm running it. Okay, here we go. I am definitely not giving you up, and I'm not letting you down, although maybe I am letting you down. Take a moment to have a sip of drink, but I'm gonna stop this here. So, this will happen to you sometime in your programming. Um, when you're working with loops, and it's good to know what to do <laughs> when this happens, because we're, we're stuck now, right? So, if you're working in VLAB, or you're working in a Linux terminal, I'm now going to press the keys Control c So, remember that, Control c is going to exit out of any program that's currently running. So I press Control c and thankfully, the program ends, I'm back at my 
my terminal prompt here so I can go back to work. Um, otherwise, there's no way out of this other than like just shutting the terminal and saying, <laughs> kill it, right? But we do want to keep working with what we're doing. Um, and the nice thing about this, if you've compiled your code with DCC, uh, DCC will tell you where you were uh, when this program had to be stopped. So this is the symbol for control C, but on your keyboard, control is the bottom left corner of the keyboard and the letter C at the same time. So you hold down control and press C and this will stop something. And it's very, very useful because, I don't know if you can hear that, someone's trying to interrupt me. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the nice thing about this is it will point out to you which loop it was stuck in. Yeah, and, um, and that way you can go into your code and you can say, okay, this is the loop that doesn't end. Uh, <laughs> if this is the loop that doesn't end, then I need to look at this code and figure out what I'm going to do to make sure this ends properly. Uh, this loop is an example of something that never ends, so I'm going to have to comment this out so that it doesn't run again while I'm trying to demo other, other loops to you. Okay, so I'm not sure which of these bits I need to... Okay, I'm going to leave it all commented out for now and I'll show you some other things. Okay, so the point of that whole uh, exercise is A, if you're ever going to start a loop, you need to think about how you're going to finish it. Um, and B, if you end up during your programming um, making a loop that isn't going to end, um, control C is your way of exiting those loops. So another type of while loop that I will show you is having a, what we could think of as an exit condition, something that says when a certain thing happens, um, this is the point where we would exit the loop. So what I'm going to have here is a variable and this variable says end loop. So I'm going to think of this variable as a true false variable. So something that can be zero or one. So if end loop is zero, then I'm saying don't end the loop, right? So that's like, that's like me saying, um, I don't want to end the loop, so end loop is zero. And then I'm saying while end loop is equal to zero. So I'm saying, here's my question. If end loop is equal to zero, so if I'm not being told to end the loop, then run the loop. And then inside the loop here, I'm doing a bit of information. None of this is important to the loop, but it's just showing you an example of how I could do something. So I could scan if a number in, so this is me just reading in a number and then I'm testing whether it's even or odd. So if I mod a, uh, a number by two, it will tell me if it's even or odd. So if the mod of two is zero, then the number is even. And then I've got an else statement here that says the number is odd and it flips end loop. So what I can do here is I can say, um, I will keep looping and you will keep typing in numbers. If you keep typing in even numbers, then we can keep, we can go on forever. We can keep typing in even numbers. But if you type in an odd number, I'm gonna say that's the last number I'm gonna look at, and then we're gonna exit the loop. So this is a loop where we don't have a, um, a, a sort of predefined idea of exactly how many times this thing would run. Like the, um, the wait, where is it? The infinite Rickroll loop that we have here, this one technically can go forever. If I just keep giving it even numbers, it goes forever. Um, but the second I give it an odd number, it will end. So we don't know how many times this thing is gonna run, uh, but it's, um, it does have a clear condition that says I will stop. So when we get an odd number, we change this variable, right? And if we change the variable that's being checked in the while loop, then that might change how the while loop's gonna behave. In the same way that in this one, we kept changing this variable until we hit the condition where it wasn't going to um, wasn't going to equate to true, and then the while loop won't run. So I'll show you this one running, because again, we have this one in code here. Let's make sure that this is the only thing that's running. I have another loop after this as well. So this is my code here that says, I'm not going to end the loop until I see an odd number. So I'm gonna save this, control S, if you want the keyboard shortcut for saving, using my up and down arrow keys to 
um, get old compilation commands and then the run command and this time we'll be running this code not any of the other code which I've now commented out so please type in a number I'll type in the number four and it's like that number is even please type in a number number eight that number is even right so if I just kept typing in even numbers this thing would keep asking me for numbers but if I give it an odd number the if else here is not going to run the even number part it's going to go into the else which is the odd number part which should set the um, variable end loop to one which should make sure that the while loop says I only run when end loop is equal to zero so if end loop is equal to one that's like I've said now end the loop this loop won't run number is odd and we can see that the loop didn't run again because the program has obviously finished here um, and is going on so we can see now two different ways oh I can't scroll I was going to scroll up to the results of the first one. Anyway, we had one way of making something run exactly 10 times, and then we have this way of making something run who knows how many number of times. You know, we could run it until someone does something different. Interestingly, if you think about the stuff that we were doing with Dice on Wednesday, um, the second Dice Checker that was uh, verifying or correcting a user's input, we could do something exactly like this, where they type in a number, we could say that's invalid, you have to try again. And we could keep making them try again until the number is valid, and then we, can, we can continue. Say that 10 times fast. So this is a way that we can um, often work with a user and say, no, you're just gonna have to keep trying until this is correct. It's like an auto test. <laughs> okay. So moving on a little bit, I'm just going to, do I fit? Yeah. <laughs> I like putting myself in the memes. <laughs> so You can put code inside a loop, yes. So anything that we put inside the loop was code. Which means that a while loop is also code. So you can see here, I've got printf, scanf, if statements, else statements, all that kind of stuff inside a while loop. So there's no limit on what's inside a while loop, which means you can put a while loop inside a while loop. If we put a while loop inside a while loop, that means every time one loop runs, it runs the other loop, which means we can actually multiply the number of times something happens. So if I have a loop that runs 10 times, and I put a loop inside that loop that runs 10 times, the inner loop is going to end up running 100 times because the outer loop ran 10 times. And then the inner loop, oh, sorry, the, the code that's inside the inner loop will end up running 100 times. And we actually use this for a whole bunch of stuff in programming. It's actually reasonably common to put loops inside loops um, for different things. So let's have a look at an example. This is actually a reasonably simple example of putting loops inside of loops and I do this visually because I think it's much easier to understand loops in loops if we do it visually. I'm going back to my normal size. I think you can see me pretty clearly anyway. So what I want to do is I want to print out um, uh, a, a square full of asterisks basically like I'm just printing out a grid of stuff. So let's have a look at the code here. I am now going to uncomment this bit of code but comment out all of the rest so this is one of the nice things about these uh, comment things is if you just want to like turn on or off large sections of your program at different times you can use these to just kind of um, cut off a whole bunch of things and turn them into comments hmm, not sure why that is saving incredibly slowly One or more of our VLAB computers have been playing up a bit recently. Alright, I'm just going to talk about it while it thinks in the background. So, the simple way of looking at this is we just look at this. So, I'm going to do something funny, I'm going to comment out most of this. Uh, maybe I'll leave that bit in. 
So if I only run this code, I have int x equals zero. And so you can see x is less than 10, x is equal to x plus one. You can see me using this. So I've got a counter, I've called this one x because it's actually the x coordinates of what I'm doing. Um, and I've said when it's gonna end, which is up to 10, and I've had it adding one each time, which means it's gonna run exactly 10 times. So if this is gonna run exactly 10 times, let's run this and see what happens. So I'm gonna save this, compile it, run it. I now have 10 asterisks here in a row. So now I've got a row of stars. If I want to do a square of stars, because I have the code to run a row of stars, I can say put that code in a loop, and then each row is going to go one after the other in the loop. So what I'm going to do now is turn back on the code that I had around this, and have a while loop that is on the y. So we've got the y coordinate, which is like the, the row number, and the x coordinate was the one that was going across and printing a row. So I've printed one row of 10. If I want to print 10 rows of 10, all I did was do the same structure for running something at multiple numbers of times and putting it outside of this code here, which was the single row. So we've got code for a single row, and that was a looping code. That was looping code. And then all I did was say, okay, I know that I've got something that prints a single row and I want to print 10 rows. So I take the standard setup for doing something 10 times and I wrap it around that and this should do this 10 times now. So what I should get out of this once I compile it and run it is 10 rows, um, each row with 10 stars in it. So now when we think about um, what people were talking about with, uh, with word addition, uh, but in general just any kind of really sort of um, mind numbing, mind, mind numbingly repetitive code. What I could have done to make this was I could have done printf star, printf star, printf star, printf star, ten of those, and then printf new line, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and I would have ended up with like I don't know, looking at minimum a hundred lines of code because there's a hundred. Oh, it's actually. 110 lines of code because there's a, there's a silent character on the end of each of these to print this. But instead of that, I've just got this little structure here, which is like, what do we got? That's 12 lines of code, including a whole lot of comments uh, to make it really clear what this thing is doing um, so that you can learn from it. So this is probably only, I think, eight lines of code otherwise um, to do 110 operations. So that's one of the kinds of things that we're going to do with looping that's going to make things a lot easier for us. Ooh, there was a, Rani says a really good question there. Oh, Shrika was saying, yeah, did I mean X as in the horizontal row and Y? Uh, X was the horizontal coordinate, so it depends how far left or right basically something is, and Y is how far up or down something is. So yeah, I was actually using X's and Y's there, here, as nearly their mathematical coordinates. And anytime we're working with two-dimensional grids, we will potentially be using things like X's and Y's. This is like one of the few times that we will actually be using um, single letter variable names because they're reasonably well understood that the X and Y, the X is the left and right coordinate and the Y is the up and down coordinate. So a lot of the time we will potentially use that. Oh, people are asking whether the computer knows that X means something. Now, X is just a variable name. The fact that it's X is something for us as humans. So I could have, if I wanted to, written this whole thing where, where it says Y, I would use the word row, and where it says X, I would use the word column, and they would actually make sense as well. Um, so I just use X's and Y's because I think mathematically that does make sense to people. So this is the drawing of the gridded stars. So. I don't think I need to necessarily talk about this, yeah. So the X loop writes the line, and the Y loop writes multiple lines. So I think I've already explained that as I was doing it. Now, 
I did want to say something else today because it's actually very important. And this is something that's going to come up later more than it's going to come up sooner. But you'll get you'll get the feel of it as things go on. <laughs> and I've got a way of remembering this, which I call the Vegas rule of, of program scope. Uh, program scope is the technical term for this. But the way I like to explain it is what goes on inside the curly braces stays inside the curly braces. So this is old joke about like what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, it's probably a really horrible thing to do. <laughs> it's like people just trying to like um, turn off their morals while they're on holiday and I'm not really sure that's the best thing to do. But you know. So, so. If we look at some of the places where we have created something or we have done something the curly braces are more than just a way of collecting code together. The curly braces say that anything that is created inside the curly braces will only exist as long as the curly braces exist. Once we hit the end point, the closing curly braces, everything inside it basically gets destroyed. Um, so there's an interesting thing where we have got an int x in the grid drawing code that is inside a set of curly braces. That's this one here. So an interesting thing about this x is we say x is equal to zero, and then while x is less than 10, you print stuff and then you add one to x. Now we could think of doing something like this. And we go, well, we've got two integers, we're gonna use them. So we'll just create the two integers and then we'll do our while loops. I wonder how many people now are, are looking at this and going, he's behind you. Because what I have done now in doing this is I've, I have introduced a problem in this code. I'm gonna run it first. Let you see what happens when I run it. And it'll be interesting because we'll look at it and we'll say, what is going on here? And then you'll learn what it's like to be a programmer. We run our code and we say, what is going on here? <laughs> and then we have to figure out why this is the way it is. So we have one row and it appears that we have the right number of rows, but we stopped drawing stars and we're like, why, why is this? Because if the variable is outside of the curly braces, then it is a single variable that keeps existing for every loop. And so we said x is less than 10, and then we kept adding one to x. This was our first row, we got x up to 10, and then we loop through and we come back to start printing our second row. We start printing our second row, and we say, while x is less than 10, but x was persistent, x lasted longer than the loop that it was in, so it's not zero anymore, it's still 10 from the last thing we did to it, which was add things to it. So if it's already 10, we don't print out any stars and we just skip this while loop entirely and print the new line at the end of that row. So one of the nice things that we get about putting this X here is that when we run this double while loop thing, every time we run the Y loop, we create a new X. It will not be the same X. It will be a new X variable. And each X variable lives exactly through one run of the Y variable loop. And so the X exists only long enough to do its thing. And then it disappears. And then we start a new one and we set it to zero again. Um, there are other ways we could have done this. We could have had one X variable that we kept resetting to zero, but Personally, I prefer having something that is created just when it needs to be used, it's used, and then it's thrown away, right? So you, you don't necessarily keep things around. You say, okay, I'm gonna create it just as I need to use it. Yeah. Um, oh, people are asking you about uh, for loops. Um, I think, yeah, I'll let, I'll let Rani take that one just because it's sort of outside the scope of what I need to need to teach right now, but I think people will have questions about those anyway. Okay, so that's the curly brackets. Don't worry if you don't 100% get what's going on here. Um, you will probably pick this up with practice 
there's a difference between what goes inside the loop and what's outside the loop. So anything that's outside the loop will be remembered through multiple loops, which is why when we have a counter, this int counter can never be created inside the loop because if it's created inside the loop that it's counting, it'll have a new variable every time and there'll be nothing to check. So what we do is we, we do the counter outside the loop and then it's something that remembers something beyond multiple loops. But anything we do inside the loop, it will only be remembered as long as a single run through the loop. So it's a bit complicated, um, but it will come into play eventually. Um, this is what we call scope. So program scope is the name of um, this idea, which means that the program's focusing on one thing at a time. So it's looking at one set of curly brackets and it's saying, okay, I only do what's inside this curly brackets now. When I hit the close curly brackets, I kind of throw that stuff away and I go into something else that I'm working on. We will go into this in more detail later, starting with an idea, actually it's in the next lecture, I think. So I think it's gonna be from Wednesday next week. We'll start using this a bit more. So don't worry if this is not entirely clicking yet. All right, so we're gonna take a break. The break's gonna be a bit earlier today than normal because after this break, we're just gonna dive in uh, and start writing code. So I have a looping program that we're gonna to do today and it'll take longer than our, our last program. So um, yeah, I think it's good that we have more time for it. So remember that while loops, if statements, variable assignments, all that kind of stuff are what we consider to be code expressions and I've used the word expression before as like something that we would put inside an if statement question and stuff like that that can also be considered a line of code somewhere so you could have a line of code that says is this less than this um, and then assign the result of that to a variable or something like that all of that stuff is what we consider part of the running code of our program which means <laughs> What I've got down here, yes, you can put if statements inside while loops, you can put while loops inside if statements, you can put while loops inside while loops inside while loops inside if statements inside while loops inside else statements. I don't know if that, that one might not exactly work. Inside an if else, a giant if else statement, and each one of those can have while loops inside it. Um, all of this is legal C, all of it will run. The only risk, it's not about whether it runs or not, or whether C can handle it, it's about um, whether you can handle it. Because humans, once we get further in, and you'll watch the indentation, basically, every time we put something inside something, we usually indent further. I'm gonna talk about code style later. But as we go further in like that, the harder it is for us to remember where we are in the program or what's happening. So it's like, I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Inception, where you go like they're in a dream, and they're in, they're in a dream within a dream, and then they're in a dream within the dream within the dream, and stuff, and then at some point you're like, oh, where even are you? I don't know what's going on, right? And that's what we can do to ourselves with our code if we do this by accident. We put too much stuff inside everything, and maybe at one point when we were writing this, we understood it, but we start to lose it, right? And the less readable our programs are, the less useful they are in general, because we won't be able to fix our mistakes and no one else will be able to understand it. So they won't know whether it's safe to use or anything like that. So just be careful. Once you start confusing yourself, you real, you'll probably realize that there's too many things inside each other. Okay, chicken's gonna say goodbye. And we'll take a five minute break and we will be back, it's 4.48 now, so we'll be back at 4.53, and we're gonna do go through a bunch of code and um, learn about looping.
Alrighty, I'm back. Um, there were a couple quick questions there in chat. Um, I should actually look it up because I can't remember exactly how the lab marks uh, work with challenges. But I think that what we do is we take out of the eight labs that are marked, we take your top seven marks and then we add them together. Which means that if you've got some challenges in those and you haven't got full marks in others, once we add them all together, then the total might still be above the maximum. I think that's how it works. But I will have to talk to Tom because he actually knows the code that adds it all up. Um, and we can make sure... Actually, ask the question on the forums. They can pass it to Tom and he can actually dig through the code and make sure that's exactly what it's doing. I think it is. But I've never really gone to that level of like checking, looking for specific students that have that condition and seeing how it worked. Um, Eleanor was asking for hints about doing word addition without that many repetitions. Let me teach you some more stuff as time goes on. Because if you use looping, I don't know if looping actually does that much for word addition, but the next thing that I'm going to teach you next week will definitely help. Okay, let's go on, because I've only just shown you what looping is. I think now it's a good time for me to um, do a demonstration of looping and um, show you some of the things you can do with loops in a program. So, <laughs> keeping on my theme, <laughs> working with dice for the first two weeks of this course, I am now going to write another program that I'm calling Dice Statistics. So as opposed to um, the first dice program, which is all about... Um, hey, stop doing that. <laughs> Someone's decided that she's hungry and so she's going to eat everything on my desk. I have a, a robot feeder that's going to feed her in a second anyway. Okay, so what I'm looking at is, I have two dice, so let's just, we just stick with like six-sided dice like we've been doing. And what we want to do is look at all the different ways that we can roll two dice. And then, given that we have all the different ways to roll two dice, let's see if um, we can figure out how many different ways we can roll one single number with those two dice. And we'll see if we have time. We're probably going to have time for this. Let's look at the odds of rolling that particular number with those dice. So... Every time we have a program and we have this kind of list of um, uh, list of all of the um, things that we want to do in this program, we're kind of going to break this down and we're going to build it up slowly. So what we're going to do first is we're going to say, what do we need to do and what are the simpler things we need to do? So we can start with the first point. We're just going to roll two dice many different ways and see all the possibilities rather than... Um, going through and and checking all this other stuff yet yeah, we'll just do the first bit first and make sure that works and then we can say all right given what we know about c which parts of c can we use to make this thing happen so this is where we break it down and we try to figure out the recipe so we need all the possible values of two dice which means we need all possible totals of the dice um, by adding them together, which means we need something that's going to go through the sequences of both dice. Strangely enough, when I give you an example of something that we're going to code, it's going to be from exactly what I spoke to you about earlier in the lecture. So we're on what we would call, what we would think of as easy mode now, where it's like the answer to Mark's question of what we're going to use is what we just learned. Later on, you go deeper into programming and things, um, you will start to build up a memory of the things that you know how to do and how they apply to situations. Uh, but for now, it's easy because it's like, well, <laughs> if we're going to go through all the possible values of a die, they're numbers, and we can count up through numbers, oh, we're obviously going to use while loops for this. Great, good stuff. We can use loops. Um, so, if we loop through all the values of one die and then add them to all the values of the other die, looks like we might be doing a loop within a loop. So, here's the code, but let's write it instead. Ooh, I forgot that I did this last time. We actually let the user pick the size of the dice. So let's do that, that'll be cool. So, let me hop across here. Um, I will uncomment, because I'm gonna leave this demo file for you to use. I'm going to uncomment everything so all the loops run except for this loop because we don't want this loop to run by default. So this demo will show you all the other loops and I'll leave that like that so you can use it. In the meantime, I'm going to make a new, um, 
a new file called dice stats and that's going to be the program that we're writing today I'm just going to do this the easy way the odds of rolling a particular number. I should slow down. You can obviously see that I'm trying to type faster than I can with the number of typos that I make. As the total of both dice. This is written by me. And we're still in February, only just next time I see you, it'll be March. All right, so there's my comment just explaining what I'm doing. That should be enough information to understand what's going on in the program. I'm gonna, I wasn't even thinking about whether we 100% need this or not. I just kind of went ahead and, and added the standard input output library because I kind of assume that most of our programs are going to use it. I set up my main, as I've done before, every time that I create one of these things from scratch. Um, this is a full working program that doesn't do anything yet, but at least it works now. So I know that anytime I compile this, if anything's wrong, it's in my own code. So that's like, you know, making sure that the main line is in there. The standard input output library is being um, included. Okay, so the first thing we had was we were going to have two dice. Let me see, what did I call them? Die one size, die two size. That actually makes a lot of sense. So die one size and die two size. And then I'm going to start off by um, you know, let the user decide the size of the two dice. So it's going to be a printf to say something to the user to ask them to do something. Oh, there was something that came up in the um, in some of the lab questions I noticed that people were doing where not all the lab questions have the um, please enter something because we don't necessarily want the auto tests to have to test exactly your spelling and grammar and stuff. So they don't necessarily have this prompt, but I tend to put all these prompts in um, because I know that it's like. It's, it's better for the user and for us to when we're testing it when we're testing the program to be able to see these prompts. So when you think about it, this line here is not necessarily needed for the functionality of the program, but it's nice for a human to see this. Um, so if we've asked them for that, we will then scan if in an integer and we will put that into the location of die one size and I'm gonna do roughly the same thing for die two so I'm copy pasting here which is actually doing a control C control V this is not something we do that often when we're programming like the more that you copy paste things the more risk there is of having repetitive code with the same mistake in it multiple times or having something where it's really hard to um, hard to modify but here for the moment I think it's okay because I've only got two dice and it's not necessarily this isn't one of those things that's necessarily going to be amazing for us to be um, looping here so So we've got our two dice here, and now we will know what the size is of both the dice. And then we're gonna do the thing where we're going to loop through both the dice. Oh wait, a lot of people are asking about dot H. <laughs> Ronnie, are you there at the moment? We're gonna learn about dot H later, by the way. 
so don't worry about it. Um, but the dot H is, I actually said this in the first lecture when I was talking about it, uh, dot H is a different kind of, uh, program file that contains C code, but we will look at that later. Oh wait, is are people saying that I've made a typo? They're not asking about dot H. They're trying to make sure that I don't get it wrong. Thank you. That was really funny. I was just going to go off on this explanation. It's like, why weren't you listening earlier when I told you what it was? But people are actually trying to remind me to do it properly. Thank you. It's okay. You can stop now. <laughs> okay. So if we have the size of the two dice, now we're going to do something. Loop through um, both dice and um, see all the possibilities of their values. Oh, I can say their combined values, I guess. All right, we're gonna get we're gonna get now. Oh, I'll, I'll leave that there because chicken's here and hanging out. Uh, <laughs> it's like a chat. This is so funny. This would be one of those things where if we're lecturing live, you'd be able to, someone would be able to just yell out to me what was going on. But at the moment, chat had to spam the crap out of me to, to tell me what was happening. <laughs> oh, Lorenzo's asking me about putting a percent sign in a printf. If you do want the percent sign to appear somewhere in a printf, like if I wanted percent to appear there, you can do this. You do 2% and then you'll get a single single percent sign appearing in the terminal. I just pointed at the terminal there, but what I meant was this, in this terminal. Okay. So if I were to loop through both sides, both dice and see all their um, possible combinations of the two dice, um, then I will do two loops. So I will do one while loop and I'm gonna put another while loop inside that one. And each of those is going to have the values of the dice from going from one up until um, the dice, the dice size. So I might call this die one value. So there's like a current value versus the maximum size. Um, since dice are going to go from, say, 1 through to 6, 1 through to 20, 1 through to 8, that kind of thing, I'm going to start this at 1. This needs to be an integer. <laughs> and this is going to go from 1 up until the size. So I'm going to say, well, die 1 value is less than or equal to die 1 size. I'm doing less than or equal to this time, so it's slightly different from my normal loops because I don't want this thing to stop when it reaches die one size. I want it to run when it reaches die one size because the die one size is a value that's going to be used. So I'm going to be using the values from one through to die one size. Um, and I'll put a little comment in here. I am in the die one value -th <laughs> run of that loop. And in this one here, I'm going to run through the other die. So that way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at all the values of one die. And for every value of one die, I'm going to match it up with all the other values of the other die. And by the end, I'll have seen all the different possible ways that a die can be rolled. So this one's going to be die two value. Oh wait, I haven't made die two value. So I need to make that integer again. Because this thing is going to restart this loop, oops, Ooh, don't want to drag that around. It's going to restart this loop inside this loop each time. So I'm going to create my variable inside for this loop. So die two value starts at one again, and it goes up until and still runs once at the, at the size of die two. So I can say die two value is less than or equal to die two size. So this means that if my dice are, for example, let's just use six sided dice for the example. Um, this runs through one and it runs one, two, three, four, five, and six. Um, it is gonna run the sixth time because I said less than or equal to. So when die one's value reaches six, it's still gonna run this one more time. And then when it reaches seven, it's just going to exit. 
and I did the same structure for this loop which is going to go through all of the values of die 2 1 through 2 and including 6 which is why I've used a different I've used a less than or equals to here rather than a less than that I did um, when I was counting from 0 and going an exact number of times so in this loop now I will have die 1 as a certain value and die 2 as another value and every time I run this loop something will be different like one of these other numbers will be different so let's have a look at what we're actually getting out of this um, so die 1 is a particular number and die 2 is a particular number let's add up the total because I know that we're thinking about the total in the future as well and I'll put a new line on the end of that I'm gonna split this into multiple lines mostly because at the font that I'm <laughs> typing at now to make sure it's nice and visible for you um, I'm gonna go out into not really being able to read my lines pretty easily so um, die one value because that's the the number that is going to be changing in the first loop and then die two value is the number that's going to be changing in the second loop so that'll tell us the current values of the two dice and then the total is going to be I'm going to copy this well, I can't be bothered typing them out again is going to be die one value plus die two value now I could see a good argument for making a separate variable for total and we will probably end up doing that but for now we're going to do this uh, like so and we'll see how this runs because we're ready to run this now at least to test what's happening oh you can notice like someone's asking about return zero I didn't even put return zero in here but this is still going to be legal C and it's still going to run so let's see what happens when I run this with say two six-sided dice that I'll type in there so I'm gonna clear this so that these uh, gedit auto like is this just auto word complete warnings don't uh, don't confuse anyone so I'm gonna compile dice stats you'll find a lot of the time when I have a program I leave it the same name as its C file because it's just easier to remember which one's which especially if I'm compiling multiple programs in the same directory like I am right now not always the best idea to do that by the way but anyway here we have this we can see what's in my directory so I've got two programs in here loop demo and dice stats but the dice stats one is the one that I'm testing at the moment so I'm gonna run dice stats and it's gonna say please enter the size of the first die I'm gonna keep it simple for now and do dice that we already know um, a lot about which is the six-sided dice so I'll have two six-sided dice and it's going through oh what's happening here did anyone did anyone notice were people yelling at me to do it see people weren't yelling me yelling at me as much can anyone see what's gone wrong here? Something's definitely gone wrong. I'm going to control C this and see what happened. Um, I'm in the inner loop. And I've done my printf. Yep, there we go. James picked up on it. I'm not sure if someone else picked up on it earlier. I didn't add anything, so I wasn't... Yeah, and, and Schnelli also figured out. No count. Yeah, so where I was using counters previously, I'm now using the dice values. And what I haven't done is I haven't finished my while loops properly. So I did my setup of my variable. I did my stop in case, but I didn't make it go. So the outer while loop, which was die one value, is supposed to be going through all the values of die one, yet it never changes them. So die one value, check this out, plus plus. I'll tell you about this in a second. Um, and in this one here, die2 value is never changing either. So inside this loop, we're going to take die2 value and plus plus. Let me let me show you something. I've got I've got some um, I've got a slide. 
around this. Oh wow, I used much n smaller variable names in this in the slides. Maybe I should do that. It would make it easier. So die one equals die one plus one. Die two plus plus. Plus plus is a shorthand for this line of code. It basically there's some subtleties, but you can think of it as this basically does exactly the same thing, these two lines of code. So what they're going to do, chicken's gone for a walk, so I'm going to aim the camera back at me. What this does is it just adds one to die two. So it's a little bit of a shorthand that makes it just a little bit easier for us to what we call increment a number. So increase its value by one. So if we want die two to go up by one, we can just put a plus plus on it like this. So this makes this a little bit easier, the lines a little bit shorter. It's not super important how long your lines of code are, but since we do this so often, having the plus plus makes things a little bit easier. Okay, so now that I'm doing my, um, my moving through the numbers correctly, let's run this again and see how it goes. Okay, we're going to compile that. I just got to check if I saved the file. Yes, I saved the file. And run it. And two six-sided dice. Okay. Now we have a more genuine result for this. So, die one were, has multiple times in this loop it has values of one because every time that die one's value is one, so from the beginning, this other loop will run it six times. So die two was going through six values and our totals here, two through to seven, they appear to be correct to me. And die, then die one goes up to two and die two goes through all of its possible values. Die one goes to three, die two goes through all its possible values and we're adding up our totals. And you, see, you can see the totals get higher as we go up because the die one value gets higher and in each, each set of six, it's six possible values. So what we should be getting here, if we, if we look at this, I'm pretty sure the math is correct here just, just by eyeballing it. I haven't tested it 100%, but I'm pretty sure that we are getting all the possible ways that we could roll two dice. So if you're playing like lots of board games and stuff like that, um, you will you will be able to once we've got an idea of how this program works, or if you have an idea of statistics and um, have done this kind of stuff in maths before, you already have an idea of how many times two um, d six that we call it two d six like d six is a six sided die is likely to roll each of these different numbers. Okay. So we're at this point now. Um, at this point, we can say see all the possibilities, and we know all of their totals. Um, and if we want to, we could now count how many times the dice were rolled. I mean, if we want to, we can just look at it and just go, there's 36 different possibilities. But if we don't know um, exactly what the dice are, so someone might put in a four-sided dice and an eight-sided dice and say, okay, give me the result. And it's like, oh, okay, we, now this is slightly different. So we can count how many times the dice were rolled just by counting how many times our loop run, ran. But what we want to do now is the cool thing is someone's asking for statistics, right? That was the, the aim of this program was uh, someone's asking us, what is the chance that I have of, say, rolling a seven? So, you know, it's, uh, it's the 1920s in Prohibition era, and I'm playing a game of craps in a back alley in New York, and I'm trying to figure out what are my odds of rolling lucky seven one more time. And, and being able to feed my family or something. I don't know, I'm just, just making up random stories. <laughs> if, if in 1920s New York, I had this computer program, then maybe I would have had a better chance of knowing exactly um, how, what my chances were of rolling, say, a seven. So let's write some code that's going to be able to count how many rolls there were, and then also count how many rolls totaled a specific amount and then at the end of it we'll have two numbers one says that this is the number of times we rolled this particular number and the other one is this is how many times we rolled the dice total and then with those two numbers we'll be able to say okay these are our odds so i've got some code here for all of this but again as i usually will do we're going to write all the code during the lecture rather than uh, rather than copying down anything from the slide, so you see how I build it up. So, we have another integer that we're going to use, and this is going to be a request from our user 
and we'll call this one the target value. So remember previously when we were doing target numbers for things, we were hiding them from the user because it was a different kind of um, a different kind of program. This time, what we're going to be doing is saying the user is going to tell us what number they're trying to roll, and we're going to give them the information. So we'll do another little printf scanf combo that we do here. We're making a very polite program that says please all the time. Um, so I'm going to say please enter the number you wish to roll and then the person will type in a number and I will put that into the location of target value. Um, again, and I know people are sort of looking at this a little bit, is um, what happens if we don't get uh, correct values in here? Um, hopefully we're still going to be okay. If someone puts in a zero or a negative value for these dies, then the die just won't be able to roll and it won't generate any of these loops. Um, but it won't entirely work. Uh, and if someone gives us a target value that's outside of the possible values for the dice, I think that one might still work. I think all it's going to tell you is you can't roll your target number. But we'll see how this goes. So, what we're going to do now is while we're in this loop, we're going to be counting up things. Um, this is one way of doing this. I know that people are going to be thinking about other ways of doing this, but here's one way of doing this where we're going to we're going to keep it simple and we're going to use our looping and get our computer to kind of do the work for us. So, actually, I'm going to keep that comment there, and I'll start a new comment here saying, set up two counters to keep track of total rolls and the number of rolls that matched the target. So I've got one integer and that was a nice name for it, total rolls. Total rolls starts off as zero. So you know how sometimes I won't initialize a number? If I don't initialize a number, then this integer right now here is a little dangerous because it has no set value. So we don't really know what it can do. Um, uh, if I start saying, so if I do this here, uh, int total equals die one size plus die two size, I could potentially cause a huge problem here because since these don't have any value yet, how could I possibly use their values? To add something up. So using uninitialized variables can cause issues. Let me show you because um, I think this will get picked up by the compiler. Yeah, so we've got this warning here. Uh, unused variable, that's fine. Variable total rolls is unused. Ah, these are only warnings. This code's going to run. Let's run it and see what happens. Basically, I'm just I'm showing you what happens when we run things that doesn't work, just in case you try this, and we'll see if it breaks something. Ooh, okay, program has crashed. Signed integer overflow. Negative something plus negative something cannot be represented in type int. So apparently, the uninitialized variables got given this number, and they both got given the same number. You may see this and I think that, depending on your compiler, DCC is definitely going to do this a lot, where if you haven't given a value to an integer, it does weird things with it, and it gives it this massive negative number. And it's crashed here saying that I have done something weird with my integers, but at least what this will do is it will remind me that none of the values that I had in, um, in my program actually had any um, uh, any values and I started trying to do maths with them. So just be careful with that. I'm going to get rid of this line because it's unnecessary. These integers are okay to use after the scanf if we're sure that the scanf put the right number in. If it didn't then we may have other issues. A lot of the time when people uh, see this problem and try to do something with it, they will do something like this.
we will initialize these to values that are outside of what we consider to be good. So I'm saying, I'm gonna say that before I start going, this integer is gonna have a negative one and there's no die, well, I'm sure there are some dice with negative ones on them, but the dice we're using that just have quantities on them will never have a negative one. And no one's going to want to roll a negative one if they are assuming these two dice are positive numbers. So me putting these negative ones in here means that I'm kind of preparing myself for what happens if none of these work. So something goes wrong here and these don't work. Then later on when I'm testing my code, I'm going to see negative ones um, turning up in these sizes or in tests and stuff like that. And if I see those negative ones, then I know that I've got a problem somewhere else. So sometimes it's better not to leave these uninitialized without a value. And sometimes it's better to give them a value like that. So now I know that it's okay for those to be negative one because each three of these values here are in these scanfs, which means the negative one, if this program runs correctly and the user gives me correct input, these negative ones will all get replaced by actual values. So that's good. If we replace it with actual values, we're fine. If we see these negative ones turn up down here, then we know we have an issue, right? So that's the difference sometimes between whether an integer has been initialized or not. Doubles are the same. Initialized or uninitialized variables. Uninitialized variables do weird things. Initialized variables may give you more information about what's going on. Especially because we've in intentionally initialized God, I'm just tongue twisting myself today. We've intentionally initialized this variable with a value we know is a sort of outside of the numbers that we're, I'm expecting from my program. So if I ever see the number negative one again, uh, later in my program, I'll know that there's something wrong with the way I coded it or the way that these scanfs worked. Contrary to that, the total number of roles is me counting how many times something happened which means if I need to count something, then the first value I give it is important. Because if I give this thing a first value of say 100, then it's gonna think that the dice were rolled 100 times before this loop even starts. But because I'm counting how many times the dice were, how many possible rolls were in the dice, then I say the total starts at zero and it accumulates, it gets larger the more times we, um, we see combinations of the dice. Likewise, um, I'm trying to think of a good name for this, but I'm going to say matching roles because that seems to be, you know, sometimes when I think of my variable names, I look at the comments above and it's like, okay, total roles, matching roles. All right, this this is fine. These these are good descriptive terms because I've thought about it here in, in English and I'm just going to make it my variable names here. So total roles and matching roles are here. Total roles should be easy for me to do because what I've got here is one while loop and another while loop. So inside this while loop here, I know that this part of the while loop is gonna run for every combination of the pair of dice. So if it's gonna run for every combination of the pair of dice, this is where total rolls gets incremented. So we should see at the end of this, uh, how many rolls we've made. But then what we wanna do is we wanna check whether the total of these two dice match the target value. So as I said before, we're probably going to not just want to add these together in a print statement, we're probably gonna want an actual variable for the total. So again, the variable inside the curly brackets is only gonna last inside the curly brackets, but that's fine because I definitely don't want the total of this dice to be part of any other times this runs because like you know every time we have a different combination of the dice so it has its own total so we want that total only to exist when we're looking at a particular run through the loop with um, one pair of dice so my total is equal to my die one value plus my die two value those are the current numbers inside our loop so die one value is inside the big loop die two value is inside the small loop. I mean, they're not different size really, but I call them that so you can you can think about one's the big overarching loop and the other's the one that goes inside. Um, so I know the two values of my dice are there and I can add them up and get a total, which means I don't need to add them up again here when I'm printing stuff out. In fact, I probably don't even need another line anymore. 
there's the total variable that I can use there. So I'm always going to get the total number of rolls going up, but then I can do an if statement here that says if Oh, I've got, I've got a better idea. I'm going to do this. I think this is what I did previously when I did this. I'm going to put the printf inside the if statement. So now we're only going to see the output of the dice if, um, if they match the number that my user is looking for. So if the total, the current total, is the same as, two equals for the same as, um, the, what did we call it, target value. If the total is the same as the target value, then we're going to, um, then we're going to print out the, the two die rolls that could reach that total. And we're going to say we had a matching roll. So we say this is inside the if statement here. So we're curly brackets. So we're saying we're only going to add one to the matching rolls if the total is the same as the target value. So matching rolls using our new notation plus plus, this is going to increase it by one. So this means that we're still going to be rolling the dice 36 times. So, well, it's only 36 if that happens to be the size of the dice that we're using. But every time we roll, our total rolls go up by one. But we only add one to our matching rolls if we matched the target value. We are going to want, after this loop finishes, we're going to want some information about this. So, um, summary of results. I'll call that the summary of results. And we will printf a summary of results. We rolled uh, this many times. Actually, we didn't roll. I'm gonna I'm gonna say this more specifically. There are this many. Someone remind me of the maths. Are these combinations or permutations? I know that they're, they're different. So combinations might not be the correct one because I think that one disregards the order of this. Um, I think it might be um, permutations of the dice. Oh wait, someone tagged me, Rani tagged me. Question from, oh, I'm gonna say, why did I set the two die values to one? Someone said permutations. Yep. Want to at least try to get that correct. <laughs> Um, so, why did I set the values to 1 to start with on both of these dice? I did that because what we're doing is we're looping through the possible values of the dice. And so the dice start at the value 1 and they end at their size. So a normal die goes from 1 through to 6 inclusive. Which is why I said starting value is 1 and the final value is the size and it's a less than or equals to so it will still run at the die's size. As opposed to... This one, where I was starting at zero because I was counting how many times I'd already completed the loop. So I've completed the loop zero times if I've never run it. And this thing tells us how many times it's run previously. And we keep going. And then we have a less than 10 because we're actually running it from, from numbers zero through to nine, which will still give us 10 runs. But this way we can read the number 10 as being the maximum number of times this thing will run. And the zero as currently how many times has the loop finished. So um, that, wa that way we can go from zero to 10 in a sense, where this thing tells us how many times it's going to run, this thing tells us how many times it has run. Um, so this is why this is our basic loop, because often those numbers are important to us. However, today we're doing something with dice. So we're starting at one because that's the lowest value that we have. Right. Okay. J-Man said possible variations would be, yeah, possible. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I could have said there are this many uh, total. Oh no, it's not the number of totals. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna leave it as permutations. Chat has decided, and if chat is incorrect, we will issue a retraction later and fix the code. Okay, there are this many permutations, and this many match the target of something. And we'll see what the target is. Oh, well, we don't know what the target is because the target's going to get given to us when we run the program. And so the three numbers that we have, um, the number of permutations, I'm going to need a comma here. The number of permutations was the total rolls. That's funny, our internal variable name is the, um, is the thing I was thinking in my head. But then when we talk to the user, we want to be officially correct with things. Okay, total number of roles, and then we counted in the variable matching roles. This is the one that was counted for the number of times we matched the target value. So that's the second one, saying how many times we matched, and what the target value was, was target value. I love it. I love it when I've named a variable earlier on in my program, and then I literally say the name of the variable for what I want when I'm trying to describe it. That's how you know you've named it right, where you're not thinking about the actual variable and you're just describing the thing that you want to find and it's exactly the same words. Um, that's often the, the the pinnacle of variable naming where you're just, just your thoughts are enough to, to remind you of the variable. Okay, so let's try this. The loop is no different, but what we're going to be printing out is different. And we're now accumulating certain values in here, which give us some information. So let's make sure I save that. Yes. Compile that and run it. And let's have a look at what our program is doing now. Oh, someone, people are looking for more of my code. Hey, oh, uh, one thing I will do also, where did I have it? I'm going to copy this in again. Every time I save my file, um, the file in that directory will get updated. So if you do need to um, uh, keep checking in real time what my code is, that will um, that will give you the answer. So if I don't expand or scroll up in time for you to get your answer of of what I'm of what I'm doing. Then, um, then you can always look at the code because every time I save it, it'll be updated. So target value, first off, we gave it a intentionally bad value just in case something goes wrong here. We'll always know that something went wrong because there'll be a minus one. Otherwise, what we're going to get is the target value will be the result of this little printf scanf. So it's going to be something that our, um, uh, our user, when they run the program, is going to give to us. Okay, okay. So let's run this. And I'm going to do two six-sided dice again because this is something that I think we keep the example simple. People will understand it because I think these are the dice people use most of the time. So two six-sided dice and a little bit of foreknowledge. I know that the average of these two dice is seven. So I'm going to put this in and we'll see how we can do it. So we've looped through. The computer will have looped through 36 times and six of these matched the target of seven. So die one is six, uh, so die one is one, die two is six, two and five, three and four, two combinations of three and four. So three and four in this direction and then four and three. And this gives us, because this thing we knew, because we tested it before when it printed out everything, we know it's going through all possibilities, but these are the exact six possibilities where the two die rolls will match up and then we'll get the target number of seven coming out. So now we have a good bit of information. So we're getting closer to our goal. Um, I think I went back a fair bit. So we wanted to show all the different ways to roll two dice. Now we were doing that before, but we actually turned that off, but that's okay. Um, and then if we pick a number, it'll tell us all the ways those two dice can reach that total, which is what we're doing now. So we've shown all the different ways that the two dice can reach the particular to total that we've given it. And then we said, tell me what my odds are. 
of rolling that number. So now we need to think about, okay, how do we tell someone, let's say their percentage chance of rolling that number? So we've got this and we talked about plus plus and then we're isolating the number. My code's not gonna be precisely the same, but it'll be pretty close. Okay, so we had something that could identify the correct roles and then we were counting up um, the correct roles um, by creating a few integers. I don't know why my font is a different size there. Oh no, no, it's not. Um, the target value, I called them number of successes and number of roles here, but um, in the code that we just created, they were um, total roles and, was it something matching? Matching roles. So I was calling them roles there. And that's the code for that. All right, so now we have the capability to get a percentage of these results. So we can say, and this should be really easy, right? Because we've got two numbers, so we should just divide one from the other. So the percentage chance of rolling something with dice sized this and this. So in the end, we're kind of just gonna give all the information back to our user about what they asked us to do to confirm that it's all still correct. So we give them the target value, that and that is another number. And I'll put a new line there. So I've gone a little bit over my 80 characters. I gotta be a bit careful if I do that, but I think a couple of characters over, I'll get away with there and then I'll put my variables um, on the next line. So percentage chance of rolling the target value So, <laughs> there's a few people who I think are yelling out, he's behind you. <laughs> yeah, someone's already doing it. Oh, someone said we could replace with this percentage. Oh, this might be a nice way to show people that we can do percentage. So to do percent, we actually do this double percent thing. So percentage chance of rolling the target value with dice sized, die one size, and then the next percent D here is the other die, which is die two size. <laughs> if you know, if you know what's going on, just, just, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna show it. But I, I allow you to say he's behind you in chat if you understand what the problem is here. <laughs> Especially if you've looked at the slides already, you'll already know the problem. Okay, so die two size. Uh, so the first one's target value. Second one was die one size, third one was die two size, and the last one is the percentage chance. And the percentage chance is pretty easy because we can just divide the two numbers, right? So we go matching roles divided by total roles should give us a fraction. Oh, this is, this is too big. I'm gonna move it down to another line. And if I multiply this by 100, this should give me the percent chance of of making that particular role <laughs> everyone's like he's behind you okay okay so i want to i want to i want to step through this though i want to step through this and show you this happening and then we'll have a look and we'll see what's going on all right so for those of you who have not seen the dastardly outlaw sneaking up behind me let's step through it and and i'll show you what's happening the drama is always more fun when you don't know what's going to happen. Um, okay, let's run this again, because I know that we've gotten this 6 in 36 thing, which should be 1 6, which is 16.66 repeating percent. And let's see what we actually get out of this. So we're going to compile it, we're going to run it, and we're just going to give it the same numbers as before, because we knew that these numbers were probably working. So. Two six-sided dice rolling for the number seven. How many possibilities, um, what, what is our chance of rolling a number seven in this? So, 
36 permutations, 6 match a target of 7, that's the same thing that we got before. And now the percent chance of rolling 7 with dice size 6 and 6 is 0. Hmm. Okay. So, how is one sixth chance of doing something equal to zero percent? So people are yelling at me now, which is pretty funny. So let's let's see. I've got some slides in here, and it's like, oh, okay, there's an issue with this code. Our code outputs zero percent way more than it should. It does actually have a chance of not outputting zero percent, but only if it's a hundred percent. So we know that we're counting our successes properly when doing this. And so this was me wanting to talk to you a little bit about integer division, because I have mentioned this previously, but I haven't really shown you this in action, and it's something that does come up a fair bit. So let's have a look at the code here, and let's look at the key element that is potentially causing this problem. So. Matching rolls divided by total rolls means that um, this is the number of correct rolls, and in our example there, this is 6 and this is 36. So 6 divided by 36 is a fraction, is 1 sixth, um, but these are both integers. So them both being integers means that. Um, the output of the division is going to be an integer. So if the output of the division is an integer, then it can only be, if this is a ratio, so if this is one sixth, um, it's only going to be somewhere between zero and one. So either 100% of these matched or, or zero to 100% of these matched, somewhere in that range, which means that the value for this division is between zero and one, which means unless it's one, an integer is just going to make it zero. So it's going to be zero all the time. There's a few different ways we can get around this, and I see there's heaps of people talking about this here. These are ints, we need some kind of floating point number to make this work. So, options. We've got a problem, we're gonna solve it. Let's look at our options. One option is we know that one of these, at least, needs to be a double. So we need to change the type of one of these variables to a double to make it work. So I could, I can do this if I want to. Uh, what are we dividing? Matching roles and total roles. I could do this. So this is one way that I could do this. Um, and I will save it and run it and I'll show you that this works. <laughs> you can tell by the way I'm talking about this, this is not the way that I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, ew. Right, format specifies in, but my argument has typed double. So it's giving me warnings here that if I want to do this output, maybe this should be a double. Oh, that's good, because it's talking about this one, saying this is now a double. Um, so that's nice for one of them, that it's seeing my percentage as a double now, which means maybe I've been successful in converting that thing to a double. But it's also saying that my die one size, oh no, my total rolls is a double, and it's asking me to put a double in there, but my total rolls is an integer. Like the rolls can't be can't be made into fractions, so let's leave it like that and see if it works. Um, I'm gonna have to save that. Yeah, save that. Compile it and run it. I'm gonna try running this with warnings, which is something that I suggest you never do. Um, but it will run with warnings, but you're gonna get issues. And let's type in the same numbers. And we go okay, six permutations, and wait, six permutations. Oh. Oh, the warning was trying to tell me something and it was important. If I read the number 36.0 as an integer, it doesn't necessarily come out as 36. So there's one issue there. Um, the target is 169 million, no. 1,692,575,492, okay, something's wrong. Um, and I think that this is going to all come apart based on me having done weird things here 
and changing total rolls to a double, which has worked here, right? So some of this has worked. <laughs> so this line is actually correct now. Seven dice, size six and six is this. But me not having quite the right um, matching output um, format types here is causing problems. And I think the fundamental issue with what I've done here is I've used a type that this is not. Total rolls is a quantity counting solid whole numbers. So I don't like changing this to a double because there was no reason for this thing to have any fractional uh, capability. And all it's done is cause weird issues in our output here because we tried to output it as an integer because we want it to look like an integer. I could change this to LF and it would look like something else, but then it would look like the total number of rolls, total number of permutations had a 0, 0.0 on the end. And I don't like that. So what I'm going to try to do instead is go back to this being an integer. So if this is an integer, I come back down here and I have my same problem as before. Um, Lorenzo saying there was a problem with target value, not total rolls. There was a problem with both of them. Um, total rolls was six instead of um, 36. So if we look before we made those changes, there should have been 36 permutations. So there were two problems there, right? So, okay, so we've got a couple of issues there. This is still a problem now because I've decided that that's not the solution that I want. So again, you know, the problem solving thing where we can go through different solutions and see which ones work. I'm gonna show you a trick. So when two numbers work together and any two numbers work together, um, the output will be the number, I guess what we'd call it, is the number with the highest level of precision in it. So, for example, if I do something like this, this now becomes a double instead of an integer. If I write it like this, it's an integer. Both of these are integers, which means this division is giving us an integer. That's the problem, because the integer division is only ever going to be equal to 0 and 1 between these two. But if I can find some way of converting one of these to a double, I can get something out of this. So I'm going to show you a cool trick. I'm going to take my 100 out of there. I wonder if I still need my brackets. I don't think I need my brackets, but I'm going to do this. Okay. All right. Do we, do we see what I did here? I have said that this multiplication goes first. If this multiplication goes first, and what it does is it says this integer multiplied by this double results in a double. So I've, I've taken my matching rolls, times it by 100, and then divided it by the number of total rolls. So the times 100 was happening outside this division before, but now I've put the times 100 inside, because you know maths, right? If you're multiplying a fraction, you multiply the top half of the fraction. That's all that happens. So what I'm doing is I'm doing the multiplication to the number before the fraction, the division happens here. But in doing so, I've multiplied it by a floating point number. And if I multiply it by this double floating point number here has a floating point in it, that's ma this makes this whole thing a double. So this is a double divided by an integer now, which will get me a double. So let's save this and see whether I'm right. If I'm wrong, this would be really funny, but I'm pretty sure this is gonna work. <laughs> I'll compile this and run it. Same numbers. Again, just to check whether this thing is working. Now we're getting our correct line here which says that there are 36 permutations and six of them match the target number of seven. The chances of rolling a seven with a dice sized six and six is 16.666. It's probably six repeating for a lot longer than this, but the LF thing is just truncating it at a certain number of digits and it's putting a 0.7 on the end. And there we have it. Now we have our percentage because what I did was I turned one of the numbers in the division into a double, which means the result will be a double. And I could do that in a really easy way because I decided to just 
take that 100 that was going to convert the fraction into a percentage and I put it into the first number. There you go. Little bit of subtle little things and little tricks. Um, and that can help us with, um, with little ways around things. So I just wanted to show you this funny little thing here, just because the integer division was going to do weird things otherwise. Okay. So I think I did this a different way. Yeah, I did it a completely different way in the slides, but I think I'm going to change my slides later because, um, this isn't as nice as the one I just did here, which I think this is much neater because this one kept the 100 outside and it just changed one of the two to a floating point number by timesing it by 1.0, which I think someone said, I saw it go past that someone said, could we, yeah, Joseph Wong said, would it be valid to do something like times by 1.0? And you could do that. And Tawaka also said, what if you did the numerator times 1.0? So a lot of you were thinking that, which is cool. Um, so you were thinking of it like, just need to change the um, change one of these things to a floating point to, to, to a floating point number like a double um, and then the division would work so yeah there we have it and we could do this now with a whole bunch of other things like let's say I've got um, two six-sided dice and I want to roll the number 11 which is a slightly different thing there's only two ways to roll 11 now it's giving me a different percentage right and I can do this for um, an eight-sided die and a twelve-sided die, and I want to see how many times they can, how many different ways they can roll a ten. And they're like, oh, with an eight-sided die and a twelve-sided die, these are the ways we can roll a ten. And there's that's eight point three three repeating percent of the possibilities of those dice. So now we've got some cool stuff, and um, oh, that's cool. Ryan he's saying chat is killing it today, so that's really cool. I'm glad that a lot of people are are seeing all the possibilities of what's going on here. So doubles rescue us from the potential issue that we had there with integers. So I now have a challenge for everyone. And this is like a special challenge for all those people who were say trying to optimize that word addition thing so that we didn't have to do as much code there's much work. So this is a challenge because this is like, this is way outside of what I'm even teaching you. But the question I have about this is, did we actually have to do all of that to get those values? Did we, did the program have to do the number of loops that it did and the amount of accumulation that it did to be able to, um, uh, to be able to actually just genuinely find out what it needs to find out. So there is actually a simpler way to do this. Um, and there's a simpler way. I, people would have seen this. I think people definitely said this when I was doing it. They were like, isn't, isn't there a simpler way to find the total number of roles? And that's the clue to get started in this. Is There is a simpler way to find the total number of roles. And there's a way to do this where we we use assumptions that we can make based on the mathematics we know instead of just like going through and letting the computer just do the coding, you know? So um, I think it's, it's interesting because there will always be different approaches to programming based on people's background and things like that. So if you're like a, a born and bred statistician and things, you might have an, a really easy time with this challenge. You might just be like, oh, I know how to do this there are mathematical algorithms that will do this where you don't just, you don't just loop through and enumerate all the possibilities and pick ones out of them um, but someone who's like you know a computer scientist first and a mathematician second will look at this and go that's fine like how long did it take our computer to run that like but, but by the time i pressed enter and looked up from from running the program um or actually press enter from the last time i input something to the program the answer appears immediately this is not something that needs to happen so people will always look at these things in different ways and as you get deeper into programming there's always this kind of trade-off between nearly like how much thinking you put in in advance to get the program to do something versus how much thinking you get the computer to do to complete what it's doing so always super interesting um and it'll be interesting to see what people come up with so what did we learn today what did we cover while loops so this has just all been about um 
how do we get the same code to run multiple times and if we need to do something like massive like this one piece of code here with the simple examples that we're doing was running 36 times so if I asked you to do this um, this problem like find out all of the sizes uh, all of the possible rolls of the two dice and how many of them meet, met the target value and stuff and I said to you you cannot use any looping in this um, then I think that would be <laughs> that would be a very hellish piece of code to have to write because you'd have to have um, multiple different sets of possible ways of running the program depending on the different dice sizes and then for each of those you'd have to write 36 different things saying if this one's this and this one's this if this one's this and this one's this and stuff like that um, it would get really really fiddly but instead what we have is a program that was only 56 lines long and a lot of that is is even taken up in comments and in setup and in explanations so I've got like multiple two-line comments here as explanations of things um, so the amount of working code here is not very much at all yet it was capable of doing much more because it could run things multiple times um, I think I've just oh, I'm not over time for once so that's that's the end of what we're talking about today your tutorials and labs next week are going to start doing uh, looping so you can start learning about this and start learning about more of the intricacies of how it works and how to get it going um, and so I will wrap up the uh, official lecture there and I'll just go into the the break mode there and I'll come back in a second and ask any oh sorry ask I will ask the questions no I will answer any questions that the chat has in a second so thank you all um, have a good weekend I hope everyone has a good weekend and um, I will see you next Wednesday and next Wednesday we will I will keep going keep introducing new things and um, seeing what we can do with them all right see you next week Alrighty, we're back. <laughs> I just find this really funny, like, I've actually got this, like, mild headache going just because, like, Friday afternoon, it's, like, really late Friday afternoon to, to, to deliver lectures. I need to kind of, like, recalibrate my week in some way so that I'm not just, like, it's Friday afternoon! It's, like, you know, it's, like, that time where at work where you're just sort of, like, ooh, I'm gonna just, like, tail off at the end of the week. I'm just, like, no, 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 this is, like, I'm gonna ramp up to this final bit at the end of the week. Hmm, hello. Someone's come to answer some questions. Okay. Does anyone have... Um, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask about the code? Anyone want clarifications or anything like that? Oh, Ricardo was asking, why 
does the LF in line 52 work? Line 52. Here. Right. So remember that LF is going to print out a, um, a floating point number. Now an interesting thing about this is this is not a variable. I feel like I should have said this in the lecture now. There's a really good question. This is not a variable, right? It's got variables in it. But remember that anytime we just use the name of a variable somewhere, um, C, when it looks at it, it's going to be like, oh, you're talking about a variable? I'll just extract the value out of that variable and use it there. So when C is working with this, matching roles here is going to end up looking like this. Uh, um, that was in the only in the example we were doing. So in other examples, it's going to be different, but it will think of it as a number. And it will think of this as a number, but this entire thing here is an expression. It's a code expression in the same way that like one is less than two is a code expression that equates to one for being true. This is a code expression that equates to a number, which in the case that we were looking at was this number, 16.6 uh, repeating for quite a while. So the 16.6 .6 repeating wouldn't be that much different from me. I'm going to make sure that I, I will control Z undo this afterwards to get back to it. There's more, there's going to be more sixes than that. But if I just type this in here, this will still work. And LF will go, yeah, I can see that. It's got a decimal point in it and a bunch of numbers. That is a double. So it's a long floating point number that I can work with. This is the same as that because this one turned into a floating point number. That one was an integer. Once we divide the two out, so after we finish evaluating the expression, if we're talking mathematically, this thing ends up being a number with a decimal point in it, which means this thing goes, yeah, I can use a number with a decimal point. I'll display that on screen like that. So often when we think about the percent %d being integers and the percent %lf being doubles, there are other things that these things can display. So they can display things that aren't necessarily variables with those types. Mm -hmm. They can display things that are expressions that end up looking like one of those types. So they're not exactly that type because they're just a value that's sort of floating in space. They don't necessarily have in the same way that this one, this one has a piece of memory on our computer where it's being stored. This one has a very temporary existence where it, it, I mean, it does exist somewhere in our computer memory. All of the code does somewhere in our computer memory, but this exists just to fulfill this purpose. And then that's it. And it's gone. So the reason the LF works here is because this expression equated to a, um, a floating point number. So a number with a decimal point in it. And it's only because of this thing that we put in here. If I take this out or if I just take this bit of it out, check out what happens. I'll compile and run this. I'll get a warning. The warning says format specifies type double. So LF specified double, but the argument, which is the, these are the arguments. So this is an argument. This is an argument. That's an argument. We can think of those as the things going into the printf um, is an int. So it's saying that this thing here is an integer because it is because we haven't we haven't made any of these stuff this stuff floating point at the moment so this is an integer um but the lf said i want a double so are you sure like make sure you're using the correct format because this might not work and when i run this you'll see that it doesn't work so oh no, actually this if i run this it's going to go back to being um it's not necessarily going to go back to being zero because this times by 100 is actually going to get us an integer but it won't be Perfect. So if I run this again with the values that we were thinking of before, ooh, no, we've got a problem. <laughs> Interesting. They're all fine, but something went wrong here and here. So the mismatch between this thing looking for a double and this thing being an integer caused this whole thing to not work. What my guess is 
is that this long floating point number is a 64-bit number. This currently is an integer, which is a 32-bit number, so that when this thing looked for a number, it looked for 64 bits of number. Wait, I'm gonna make it so you can see what I'm doing. It looked for 64 bits of number. We only gave it 32 bits of number. There's gibberish in half the number. So it's saying uh, it's not even a number. It's uninitialized, it's not a variable. So I think that's what's happening here. So these are the kind of um, issues we can get if this doesn't match up exactly here. So we set this back to what it was supposed to be. This is a double because it has a decimal point in it, in the number, even though it was never declared as a variable. So we can make values that fit with variables. So if it was an integer, we'd make a value that was um, uh, exactly the, um, the, the right number with no point, uh, no decimal point, so no fractional amounts, and it will work with the percent %d. And if we make a number here like this, that is a, um, like acts like a double, so it's got a floating point in it, then it will work with the LF. So I hope that answers that question. Um, for both uh, Ricardo and Keith who are asking that question. Oh, Brendan's saying, I should put a comment under line 54 for people who already left. Um, what will we, s um, I'm wondering what exactly that we should say here about this. Um, okay, okay, I'm gonna copy this and say, note this This expression will result in a value that has a decimal point in it. This means that it fits as a double that matches the percent LF in the printf above. Let me know if you think that that is the right thing to say there. Like if you saw that, do you think that that works for you? Um, Brendan particularly, but also uh, um, Keith and Ricardo, if this explanation helps, then I would definitely, I will leave it in there. So, uh, Jennifer had a question, not that relevant. Eh, it doesn't matter if it's not relevant. We're after the lecture now. But if you put return at the end of a function you've written that isn't the main function, will it also end the program or only the function it's contained in? Okay, <laughs> so we are jumping ahead. Um, I assume that you've started looking at stuff for the next few weeks. Uh, I'll answer your question, but also it's not relevant for everyone else because I will teach you exactly how this works. Uh, return ends the, the thing that is inside. So return will be inside some curly brackets. And if those curly brackets are one of these, which is a function like the main function here, um, it will end the thing that it's in. Um, so plenty of times we're actually going to use the return on things and it's not going to end the whole program. It's just going to end the, the particular part of the program that they're in. Um, yeah, because as you're saying, on Wednesday I implied that ending the entire program is is kind of part of what return does. Um, but it just kind of ends the current thing that you're running. Um, so at the moment, because our main is the only thing that we're running, um, so we're in one set of code that we're running, then return will end the main, and the main is the whole program. But don't worry, Wednesday we're going to talk about functions, we're going to talk about actually the return is going to get a lot more detail put in. I think it's Wednesday. I have a plan, <laughs> I just don't look at it all the time, but I think either Wednesday or Friday is functions. I know that next week we're going to look at functions. Um, Oh, Keith was asking if there's a difference between LF and F. Um, so percent %F is another way of doing it. So um, LF is us specifically saying long floating point number. Um, and that's because we're using doubles that are 64-bit numbers. Um, F is for these things called floats, which are 32-bit floating point numbers. 
Um, floats technically work uh, in the same way as doubles, but they have, like... It's, it's weird, right? Because one's got 32 bits and one's got 64 bits. But the one with 64 bits has significantly better precision than the one with 32 bits. I mean, it's the same way as, like, um, when you think about every bit that we add to an integer doubles the range of numbers that it, we can use with it. Um, every bit we add to a floating point number, it's not exactly doubles, but it basically doubles the, um, the amount of precision that we can get. And so over time when you're using um, stuff like the normal percent %f, which is the standard, not standard, it's, not, it's not, no longer a standard, it used to be a standard floating point, 32 bit floating point number. Um, you, you can quickly lose precision. Um, if you do multiple um, mathematical operations on it, especially once we start using computers to do bulk mathematical operations on things, you're going to end up with a, a situation where the number starts to skew away from the values that you wanted it to be. Um, whereas double takes a lot longer to do that. Um, so we consider it more useful nowadays to use doubles instead of floats a lot of the time. I mean, this, there's going to be plenty of arguments to use floats, I am later in the year teaching a subject on computer graphics, which uses floats instead of doubles most of the time, just because um, you can eke out a little bit more speed um, and sort of ditch accuracy on behalf of speed by doing that. So that's one way of doing things. Yeah, so the, the, the percent %f is something that you may see around the place, um, but we're definitely going to use the LFs and the doubles on things. Um, kind of as future-proofing you against um, what we call floating point error um, and lack of floating point precision as you go deeper into programming. Uh, Hussein was saying, oh, I think Hussein was just answering Jenna, Jennifer there. <laughs> Finarius is like, what if you put in a short? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it's like random extra bits of learning about programming. We can change the size of the amount of memory we're using for different values with different keywords. So there's like short integers and long integers. And so long integers are 64-bit integers, uh, short integers are 16-bit integers. And yeah, all that does is it will change the number of bits of memory that the number uses, which also changes the number of bits of memory that this thing will read when it's trying to do something. So if we made one of these integers into a 16-bit integer, and then we read 32 bits of memory, we'd probably get this kind of issue again, because this was trying to read 64 bits of memory um, when this thing was only creating a 32-bit value. So we'd probably get that same kind of issue. Um, yeah, okay, so it seems like that's a good enough answer that we've given for Jenny there. Oh, you were saying you were hitting enter prematurely. Don't worry, it's fine. I mean, like, <laughs> we've got so much stuff happening in chat that I need, like, nowadays I need to have a tutor in the chat full time. Like, I'm paying the tutors to come to the lectures now, like, one tutor each lecture to come in and just watch what you're saying because I don't, I can't watch it all at once. So, I don't know if you know, the subject's bigger than it usually is this term. So, term three last year, the last time I ran the subject, had about 500 people, and this... This term, I think we started at like 950 people. I think there's been a little bit of attrition already of like people going, oh, wait up, maybe I don't want to do computing. I'll, I'll do it later or something, or I won't do it in my degree and stuff. So like it's dropping a little, um, but it's still not going to get to the point where I will be able to talk to everyone in chat in the lectures, I think. Because <laughs> we've still got a few hundred people in the lecture watching it live. Um... And Brendan's saying there, so international standards document for C, they mandate the use of doubles rather than floats for scanf. So I think that means that, yeah, C has very much said that floats are dangerous. Can we not, can we stop using them? Because <laughs> they're, they're old and they're a little dangerous and our maths goes really weird if we keep using them. So I think that C has said this is what we're going to do. Um, Oh, well, Keith saying you were using LF when you were scanning it in and then only F when printing it out. I'm not sure what happens there. If you print out half of the bits of something, was it working or were you getting weird numbers? Oh, and Brendan's saying that if you try to do F instead of LF here, it will still do LF. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. 
Hussein <laughs> saying, saying people saw Word Edition and dropped the course. You know, like, Word Edition is... It's not meant to be done. Like, you're meant to do the lab, and then you go, okay, if I want to look at this weird stuff, that's why it's a challenge, because it's there to to maybe show people something weird and different, but it's completely unnecessary. And it's just like... And everyone's like, ah, Word Edition! That's pretty funny. There are other things in the challenges that do weird stuff like that. I mean, that's why they're not marked, you know? Um, because there's something to teach you something weird and different that's not exactly you know the thing that we're thinking about yeah okay oh jennifer said prefer not to be called jenny i apologize i think i did slip up because i think a couple of my friends called jennifer i call them jenny so i will try to remember that if you ever ask questions again i will call you jennifer not jenny um Okay, on Keith saying you tried the F instead of the LF and it still works. So there's something happening behind the scenes, either in the compiler or in the C standard, which is saying, we're just going to ignore you trying to do 32 bits of floating point number, and we're just going to fix it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Lorenzo saying you try to do everything anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. Just know when to stop, because there are parts of this course that I, I would say are significant like majority of the course shouldn't necessarily do but it's interesting to look at even if you don't complete it right so there's plenty of parts of this course and we're trying to make sure that a lot of the parts of this course are sort of marked as uh, extension content rather than necessary core content which is why those questions we could have just put into a lab um, but I think it was more important if we were going to make an exercise like Word Edition that it, it can't be something that we say you have to do to get marks. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Did anyone... Wait, Hussein's saying something there. You used a Python library and for loop to print out the C code and copy-paste it into gedit. <laughs> Wait, where from? Was that from the web page? I think we could, um, we could, you could probably just, like, select it and control C, right? I don't know if that's what you're, you're particularly doing it for, um, but that sounds pretty funny. Okay, looks like, uh, questions have dried up there, um, everyone's probably, um, going to grab their, um, Friday night dinner and then chill out for the weekend, unless there are some of you who are, um, frantically optimizing word edition before monday's deadline <laughs> if that's what you want to do with your weekend don't let me stop you because i'm the one that's teaching you so i should be happy that you want to do more work but at the same time maybe take a break over the weekend at least a little bit because once we oh hussein saying you downloaded a library that converts integers to words and use that instead that's an interesting one um, we will talk to everyone else, we'll talk about libraries later and how we can use other people's code in our code. Um, Brendan got Word Edition down to 117 lines. The official solution for Word Edition, I think, is like 150 or so. It's got a lot of comments in it as well, so like, I, I've got no problems with it being a 150 line program. Look what we did today. We did a 60 line, wait, where's my cursor? We did a 60 line program and this only took me one hour while I was stopping and explaining every single little part of it. So if I was going to do a 150 line program on my own, I'd probably do that in an hour or so as well. So I'm not too fussed about that. Uh, spending an hour on a challenge question is totally doable. There will be challenge questions later that will 100% not fall over in one hour's worth of work. <laughs> so we'll see how you go with those. Oh, happy birthday, Jennifer. Oh, happy, I, I'm like, I'm so happy that you actually came to a lecture on your birthday. That's, um, I don't know if I'd be off celebrating instead, but then I'm probably going to end up lecturing on my birthday at some point this year anyway. Um, but yes, happy birthday. Um, I will, um, wrap it up here, I think, because now we're just chatting. <laughs> uh, and have a good weekend all, and I'll see you next Wednesday with some more... C content and comp1511 content. Oh, Joe's asking what keyboard I use. Okay, fine, I'll answer one last question. I don't know how relevant it is what keyboard I use, but sometimes I like showing off my toys. 
So this is a Corsair. What's it? I can't remember what the code is. It's like a Corsair R65, I think. So I, this is my, my old, like if I was going to be programming full time on a computer, I would have a numpad because not having a numpad really sucks. Um, but I, I got this for gaming so that it was a really narrow um, keyboard so that my mouse and keyboard, like my WASD and mouse hands were closer to each other because I was getting like back and shoulder stuff. So I wanted them closer in. Um, oh, Jennifer wanted to see chicken on your birthday. I don't know where she's gone. She, she went for a walk. So, but at least she was here and you got to see her a lot anyway. Um, oh, it is Ember says the K65. So you, you remember my keyboard better than I do. Um, I, I, I don't know. It might actually be an R65 with, cause it's got RGB for every, every key has its own light and you can get them to change colors and stuff. Um, I think these are MX cherry red switches. They're the ones that don't click and just have this even pressure all the way down and back up. Um, so it's kind of nice. They're nice because they give you this kind of just long, long press physical kind of feel, which is much nicer than any of the laptops that I have. Anyway, enough random talking about my keyboard. <laughs> I'm going to wrap up the lecture now. I should probably delete the end of this lecture when I upload it. But anyway, see you all. See you next week.